Good morning. Uh, this is The Filmmaker's Life. Welcome. And my name is Joanne Butcher. I'm a business coach for filmmakers. And the purpose of this interview series is really to speak to filmmakers who are already on the path in their careers so that uh, we can learn from how they did it. And, and one of the things that I have learned in doing these interviews now since well, since COVID started, <laughs> um, is that no filmmaker is has the same path as any other filmmaker. So that's really something that I, I find fascinating. So today I'm going to introduce you to Ian Harnerein, who, uh, as as always, will will learn about you as we go along, because I'm going to ask ask questions. Uh, we shared a bio before via email, but um, but here we 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 don't do the bio. Uh, so thank you so much for coming. We had to change the time for Ian because Ian has a very uh, important meeting every Thursday. <laughs> so we but we decided to change the time because I, I really wanted to get to meet you. I almost met you in Trinidad at the last festival, but it it it, it didn't work out. So uh, welcome to The Filmmaker's Life, Ian. And the first question that I always ask is, when did you first know that you were a filmmaker? Hmm. Uh, well, first, thanks for having me, for sure. This is part of an illustrious um, guest list in the past, so I'm, I'm glad to be a part of it. Um, you know, it's, it's a really good question. Filmmaking came to me very much later in life than most people. Like I can't say that growing up, I had dreams or aspirations of being uh, a filmmaker or making movies. Um, I was a scientist before I became a filmmaker. Mm. Um, and I was in graduate school for, for physics in Chicago. Physics is very scary to me. Why? <laughs> I had to get a tutor. I had to get a tutor when I was in high school to you had, get through physics. You, you had bad teachers. You had bad teachers, yeah. which is which is a problem. Yeah. Um. But yeah, no. I was I was in graduate school for physics, and um, I was at a point in my life where I was, you know, sort of dissatisfied with what I was doing. The research was great. Don't get me wrong. What I was doing, but the day to day of it was not what I saw myself doing for the rest of my life. Had um, you planned on teaching or had you planned on going into research? Yeah, or you know, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life in, you know, in my undergraduate. And somehow I ended up in graduate school because it just seemed like a way of prolonging a decision. <laughs> yes, um, yes. And yeah, it, it wasn't, I, I saw what the what my life would be, right? Like I know what the structure is from that. You you know you stay in academia, or you go off into industry, um, and that's not what I wanted to do with with my life. It just didn't seem that that like I had colleagues, you know, classmates and my mentors that loved it, that really really loved the work that they were doing, and were passionate about it. And um, I wasn't one of those people. I found myself far more interested in their stories or like the story of science, the story of scientists. Uh -huh. And that's when I started to think that, you know, I wanted to be a, uh, a storyteller. Um, and then There's I was now called science of communicate. No, yes. No communications of science. I'm, I'm not saying it right, but I have a client who studied it. Uh, yeah. But which probably back then, I'm not sure that that existed, but yeah, uh, in different forms, like there are there are people that were always trying to to do that, but it's become a little bit more refined, I guess. Uh, and it was sort of like something that you discovered along the way that you figured out on your own. But now it's like, okay, there's a clearer path on on how to do that now. Right. So when you decided, oh, I want to be a storyteller, were you able to just switch? I mean, or did it take a long time? How did that happen? Yeah, so it's um, it's it's kind of strange. I was, what I was doing at the time in Chicago is that I was volunteering at a um, at an after school program uh, as a tutor or as uh, or as a mentor. Um, if you remember, if you know anything about America in like the seventies and eighties, there were these infamous housing projects in Chicago called the um, Cabrini Green Housing Projects. It's where. Oh. Yeah. Where good times were set, right? Uh, like that. Right. That also. Um, 
you know, it was called the worst place to live in America. Right. Known and for so, violence, poverty, right, exactly. all the horrors. Right. That's all been torn down now. It's kind of, it's really interesting. But at the time they were still, they were still up. And so I was volunteering as a tutor and as a mentor. And um, the program, I don't know how it happened, but somebody, someone donated a bunch of cameras and a bunch of computers, um, like a bunch of old iMacs. And the program leader was like, hey, we're, we have this equipment. Um, we should set up like a video club, but none of us know how to do it. Uh, who would want to do it? I was like, well, I don't, I don't know anything about it, but it sounds interesting. Why not? <laughs> and so I started doing I that. Six, like, I can set up computers. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was. <laughs> I mean, I didn't know how to use a camera. I didn't know how to use any of this stuff. Right. And, um, we, you know, we just started doing fun stuff with the kids, like doing, allowing them to, you know, make fake commercials and spoofs and music videos and whatever. But what I, what was really important to me and what I, um, I guess was the, the light bulb moment is when we'd like watch back the stuff that they had made. And um, there would be a delight on their face, right? And and I realized what it was. It was they were seeing themselves yes. on screen, right? They were literally seeing themselves, and they were in control of of their image. Yes, and so that had a lasting impact on me. Yeah, absolutely. So powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started questioning, like, how come I haven't heard stories that uh, reflect my life, or scientists, or science, or um, my culture? And that's when I was like, okay, well, let me let me become a storyteller. Let me try to become a filmmaker. Um, and so I, I, uh, I applied to, to film schools, um, in America. Like, I think I Googled it. What are the best film schools in America? Um, and I applied to them. Uh, I got in at NYU, their graduate film program and, um, I moved to New York. Uh -huh. that, yeah. I've been going back and forth between Canada and, and New York and Trinidad, uh, ever since. Well, so Trinidadians are always so international. You know, I got a I got a Facebook message from one of my aunts the other day. She said, oh, I'm in California. And she's like in her late 80s. Wonderful. <laughs> I like, hope I'm the same way when California. I'm that age. Yeah. That's great. They're all like that, though. They're all like that. My, my father just died. But uh, uh, my godfather, you know, goes to England once a year from Trinidad and um, my family's all all over and traveling all the time. I don't know. It's a very Trini thing. Yeah. <laughs> you have family somewhere and yeah, it's great. We're everywhere, they say. Everywhere, everywhere. <laughs> uh, so you went to NYU. What was that experience like? I have a client who went to NYU and he felt as though it really did a good job of teaching him the craft, but it was, he thought, set up to help him get a job in Hollywood, and he didn't have an interest in getting a job in Hollywood. He wanted to make his own films. That was his... Uh, I, I guess, like, I... Yeah, I don't know. That definitely was not my experience at all. Um, yeah. I went... So I went to the graduate program, and I think it really works for someone like me that really had no background in film, didn't know how to make a movie at all, mm. hadn't really touched a camera. Um, and, yeah, they, they teach you how to make a movie, right? How to how to use it within the first six weeks you're making a movie. Um, and you're right, like they teach you that stuff, but what they can't teach you is the stories that you want to tell. Right. Um, and that has to come from within, that has to come from life experience, that has to come from something that you have to say. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, I, I didn't, from my experience, I don't think they really did do a good job of setting me up for Hollywood in any way. Okay. In fact, the exact opposite i think it was more about getting you to become an independent filmmaker ah. and do everything your own right that, to reject that system of you know uh -huh. waiting on somebody to give you a check and you just go do it yourself with your friends interesting because he he was in the undergraduate you were in the graduate program so um but that's very interesting to hear that that's that's nice now i feel as though i can recommend the graduate program <laughs> like I, I teach in the undergraduate program now so you so maybe we're like maybe there's been a shift in terms of you, you know how we what we're trying to get our students ready to do um because we're definitely i think personally just from me and just speaking with my colleagues i think we're far more interested in independent film uh, mm -hmm. than hollywood system because yeah. if you want to learn hollywood like nyu is not the place for that you got to go to the west coast schools out in california usc or something like that ucla and yeah, all the schools yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. So um, you went to NYU Film School, but you made a film in your first six weeks. 
<laughs> yeah. Had you already had thoughts? Because well, you said even when you saw the kids' faces, seeing themselves on screen, um, that you have this idea of, well, but wait, what about my story? You know, I haven't, I haven't seen that. Right. Right. It, it becomes, <clears throat> honestly, it, it takes, that was one of the great things about the program as well. It's getting you, allowing you to become comfortable with who you are and what those stories are that you want to tell. Mm. Because I mean, my first student films, which will never see the light of day, no one will ever see them is yeah like you can see that i'm not i'm trying to please people in that i'm trying to what i think the professors want to want to see uh -huh. what i think a movie is or it's like a a regurgitation of things that i've already seen basically yeah. yeah um and it takes a long time for somebody to become comfortable with who they are and what mm -hmm. it is they want to say i just and was mentioning the other day that even if you go and see picasso's early works they're extremely traditional. Yeah, and he absolutely he mastered the form of traditional painting, traditional narrative painting before he started off on his on his modernist experimentation. Um, and in a way, I think that that's just part of the the process is is that 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 mastering the form piece, learning how to tell a story the same way everybody else tells a story. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. You've, you've got to learn how to, you got, you got to crawl before you can walk, right? For yeah. sure. <laughs> and that's, you know, it took me many years to to really, to realize that and take that, like, take that to heart and really understand what that means, that you, that you've got to be yourself. And the more you can put of yourself into the work is that's when the work becomes better. Um, but it took me a long time to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think that also uh, for people of color, marginalized people, um, it takes something to really get to understand that, you know, my story is of interest. The, the specificity of my unique story is of interest um, because we have lived through, you know, hundreds of years of that not being the case. Yeah, precisely. I, and, and I guess that's the thing. It's like, it's not only, it's that it matters. And my, the story that I want to tell is important. And there is an audience that wants to see it and that will see it. Um, that takes, again, that understanding only came with, uh, with time. So what did you do after film school? What was your next venture? So like my, um, my thesis film, my graduating film, was a uh, was a short film called uh, Doubles with Slight Pepper. That, you you know, frankly, it probably was the best case scenario that could happen to a short film. Um, it did extremely well, even though, like I, you know, we filmed it in Trinidad for like very little money, very little support, but it became really successful. It you know it premiered at the Toronto Film Festival. Wow. It won the award there. It went on to win you know, the Canadian Oscar, it won, um, you know, several awards around the world and it was licensed in several countries. You know, it's still playing at festivals to this day, uh, which is which is crazy. When was it made? How, uh, how? We filmed it in 20, it premiered in 2011. Yep. Oh, wow. It's still yeah. in festivals? Still, still, I still get requests all the time. It's crazy. It's crazy. Wow. Are, um, they, are they any particular type of festival? Or they just like the film? Yeah, you know, mostly it's... So it screened at Raindance a couple of months ago in uh, in London um, as part of, like, a curated program of Caribbean films. Right, right. Um, right, right. So before, like, you know, when the film first premiered, it was, um, you know, it, it was sort of like the the... the the traditional festival circuit you know it went to like the you know the top tier festivals then regional festivals but now most of the the requests are just coming in from uh you know more caribbean west indian identifying festivals or programs that are specifically geared yeah. towards that cinema yeah yeah that 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 makes a lot of sense um when it first came out uh so so it premiered at tiff which is that's fantastic mm -hmm. um and uh and then um, after that, 
it won the was the genie award at TIFF or oh, so those are two separate things right so it okay. won the uh, the best short film award at TIFF and then that's what sort of qualifies you for for the genie award mm -hmm. when you're you know you're up against a whole bunch of other you know short films as well yes um so the thing about uh doubles What's the full title? Doubles with slight the short, pepper. The short is called Doubles with Slight Pepper, yeah. Doubles with Slight Pepper. The thing that's interesting to me about that is that there's nobody who is a uh, Trinidadian who would understand the title. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's right. There's no, there's just no way. So um, one of the things I'm always talking to my clients about is that the title is the first place that you can market your film, you know? So you deliberately chose a title that would speak to a Trinidadian. I don't know that it would even speak to another West Indian. You, you know, this, this is a really, I'm, I'm glad you asked this question because this was this was like a really crucial decision that was made decision, on, yeah. mm -hmm. on my part, the, the actual title of the film. Um, it, was, it was always called that. Every single early draft of this film had that as the mm -hmm. title mm -hmm. um, for a number of reasons, but one of them is that you're right. It's it's uniquely Trinidadian. Perhaps some people within the Caribbean would know it, uh, but mostly it's for the diaspora as well. Um, you know, people, you know, the cooler people in New York, in Toronto, in, in uh -huh. London, in Miami, those people will know what it is, right? Uh -huh. People of the culture will know what it what it what it's talking about. But for the most part, people don't know what it what it means. Uh -huh. uh, and I'm I'm okay with that. Like I think, for me, I've always been intrigued by um, titles that people don't really know what it means, but once they've seen the film, they know what it means. Ah, okay. Like the Squid and the Whale. I think the Squid and the Whale is like the best, like film title I've ever, <laughs> I've ever known. Where it's like I have no idea what the Squid and the Whale means and what that means in, in the movie, but by the end of the movie, I'm like a. Of course, it's called the squid and the whale. There's no other title for this movie than that, um, and so that's what I always try to achieve is uh, is that, um, and it it is like that's part of the, you know, be, because the film was so successful and was able to travel the world, and you know, I would go to as many screenings as I could. You know, the the first question that always comes up is, what are like what are doubles? Where, you know, where can we can get, I get them? some? <laughs> yeah, we're gonna get some, and also why are there or which part of India did you shoot this? Oh, a really common oh. question. Always, always, always. Oh, I that that I I. I why I are they talking like that? Uh huh. Uh huh. Oh, why are they talking like that? That's an interesting one. That's funny because in the in the opening scene, as he's riding his bike with the doubles on his bike, um, I was like, oh, it's so good to see Trinidad on screen. That was my first feeling about it. It's like, oh, it's so good to see Trinidad on screen. It, 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 it didn't cross my mind that it was India or something like that. But um, as as we go through the story, um, and we, I could be somebody who didn't know what doubles was, and I could learn what doubles right. was, right? I could learn all these different cultural implications about it's poor people's food, you know? It's it's um it's something that people love to eat. I mean, the one of the things I think about the title um is that because because I saw the title long before I saw the film. And one of the things I feel about the title is that it's that there's this thing about doubles that for Trinidadians is this beloved thing. I, I have a client making a, a science documentary about pigeon peas. Oh, nice. Right, it's this beloved thing for Trinidadians that other people don't necessarily know. Um, mo you know, most people that I I talk to about it don't know what pigeon peas are, but I grew up on pigeon peas. Right, right, of course. But, and, and they and they were my favorite. <laughs> um, so there's this whole play. To me, the film is doing all this playing between the hyperlocal, which which makes the film about a thousand times better from my perspective. 
Yeah, I, I guess like with with all of my work is what I try to do is to get specific, but at the same time, never lose track of what people are really there for. And that's like the human story. Yeah. Um, and so like the, the story that I do tell is, you know, it's, frankly, it's been told before, right? It's just like a father son story, essentially. A estranged father, estranged son, and um, with the mother as well, and that relationship. That's been explored several times. Sure. Um, but it's, the details come in, the cultural details are there. But as long, but if there's no heart in that story, I don't think the film is successful in any way without that part. Right. Uh, and I pay, like in all my work, I pay really close attention to that is what's the heart of the story? What's the human drama that's happening? Because that's what's going to allow this film to play around the world. Mm -hmm. um, that's what like people in Japan are going to understand. That's what, you know, people in the Southern states are going to get. That's what people in France are going to get. Uh, they're going to be able to understand that. They may not understand the food, and they're definitely not going to understand the accent, but they'll understand this relationship that's happening here. Yes, definitely. And they'll be running around looking for doubles everywhere right. they go. <laughs> exactly. Um, so uh, what was, how did uh, you raise the funds for this film, and how did you get Spike Lee on board? Um, yeah. And you said it was your student film. It was your final student yeah. film. Do you, yeah. Did you raise the money while you were in film school to make the yeah, film? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, of course. So um, so we, we raised the money a number of ways. One of them was actually not a number of ways, a, a, really just a couple of ways. Um, so Spike was a professor of mine at, at NYU. Um, he still teaches in the in the graduate program as well. And like you can sign up for office hours with spike mm -hmm. and like he'll read your script and he did he gave me really helpful comments wow. um and he watched every edit of the film the film would have been really different from without his notes to be honest he gave like really insightful yeah. notes yeah. um and yeah so he, he helped he helped on that aspect he, of it. what kind of things did he focus on in the storytelling purely about story just like it was, you know, one of the things I learned from him was actually the beginning of the film was very different than how it ended up being. Like we shot many scenes that we ended up cutting, particularly at the beginning. The beginning was much longer, um, but he, you know, he was really adamant. I remember he was just like, nobody cares about this stuff. Just get to the story. Just get to the story as soon as you possibly can. Oh, that's yeah. such great advice. Oh, it's great advice for a short yeah. particularly. Yes. I think we ended up cutting like, at least two minutes. We cut a character completely out. Wow. Um, and we cut like minutes off of the opening just to get to the story as soon as possible. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, what great advice. I'm going that's really to great advice. that forever. Yeah, just the beginning for short, you just have, your story has to begin within the first two minutes for sure. I think that for, of features. I, I teach that in of features. But I just Absolutely. like, I'm going to be able to say Spike Lee said that. <laughs> because they, you know people don't listen to me but now they're, they're going to listen I I have another one which is from Antoine Fisher mm -hmm. and Antoine Fisher said um, he was in a clubhouse room I was in one day and he said um, well when I'm writing a script I look at the dialogue and I say one line two lines three lines is probably too many yeah absolutely <laughs> I love that absolutely I love that Antoine Fisher says, I can, I wouldn't say that. I'm not, you know, but hey, so <laughs> Spike that's, Lee gets the story as fast as possible. That's one of the things, you know, I learned along the way as well. Is like, if you've got three lines of dialogue, most likely it's redundant and it's probably just one line that you need. Wow. Uh, all the time. And, and it's funny, you know, because I see um, the worst offenders for being slow in the opening as documentary filmmakers. Documentary filmmakers are always trying to be beautiful and creative and have this lovely opening. And I'm like, where are we? Why am I here? What am I watching? Yeah, just get to the story immediately. <laughs> immediately. Uh, especially, especially in a short, like you just don't have the people's attention for a short. Right. Um, oh yeah. So in terms of funding, so he uh, he actually gave you know he supported the film financially as well. Gave us a bit of money to make the film, and then the rest of it was um, 
I raised 10,000 on Kickstarter. And that was really, really difficult. It was really hard to do that. Um, just in terms of the, t the time commitment that was necessary to make that happen. Well uh, done. <laughs> yeah, that, that's how we funded the film was primarily through those two things. Yeah. I think yeah. I had like a, like, I think I put in a small amount of money, like a couple hundred, maybe a thousand I put in, but for the most part, it was Spike and Kickstarter. Right. That's fantastic. Cause um, I have heard, in fact, I have a client from Tobago oh, great. who went to Florida state mm -hmm. and when they, when he went to make his master's thesis film, they told him it wasn't, he wasn't allowed to fundraise. Oh, really? And I've, I've heard that several times. So, you know, the film schools are not allowing people to raise money. So I was really, I was really glad to hear that you were, you were able to raise money for your film. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, I know because I teach her now at NYU. Yeah. That's, that's primarily how everyone's making their films. Um, that's awesome. Yeah. Is, is through, through crowdfunding. I, th I think that's really the, I'm kind of surprised because I, it begs the question of who owns the films. And I guess those schools would own those films because. Oh, that's an interesting question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, but what he came away with was uh, that the wealthy kids at school could spend whatever they wanted on the yeah, absolutely. position. Um, I know that USC has a program where you can get grants through the school. So there are different models, but yeah, he was he was literally told he was not allowed to raise money. For the that's wild. Yeah, here even with, with, you know, my own experience is you can do whatever you want, just get the money for it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's true, right? Like you can do whatever you want, um, but you got to make, you got to raise the money yourself. That's great. So um, I, I, I often tell people that shorts are not going to get them where they, where they hope to get, but yours did. So what was the impact of making a short that did that well? on your career as a filmmaker on, you know, how, what was the impact of making that superb short? It's, it's a great, yeah, it's a great, great question. It, you know, it, it impacted in ways in which I wasn't expecting. Um, like no one came to me with a blank check and said, here's a movie or here's a whole bunch of money, go right. make your next project. Right. That wasn't at all. Um, there were people that were interested in what I was going to do next. Uh, you know, there were like agents and managers and whatever else. And they said, whenever you have a project, let us know what it is. Um, a couple of other things happened as a result of that. Like I became, um, because the film did really, really well, uh, I was invited to go to, to Cannes and be a part yeah. of this Canadian contingent oh, of, yeah. of filmmakers out there. Right. And, like I went just purely on on lark just to go see Ken, which was which was an education unto itself. I don't recommend it. I really don't recommend it at all. I think it's a horrible place for film <gasps> to go, unless you have a film playing at the festival. Oh, okay. Sure. Uh, but other it's than that, I, I feel about Sundance. I've been to Sundance eight, nine, ten times. Yeah, and I, I just I just I can't make myself do it anymore. It's, yeah, these are these are terrible places for filmmakers, unless you have a film in the festival for sure. Um. But what what was what was really cool about it though was you just end up at random places and meet random people. And one of them, one of the people I met, I remember at this at this bar afterwards was um, Scott McCauley, who's the editor of Filmmaker Magazine. And then a couple of months later, I, you know, we were we were just talking there, and a couple of months later, he's like, "We're gonna, you know, we're gonna put you on the list for the the twenty five new filmmakers, the twenty five yeah. new faces of filmmaking, which was great of independent film." And it was solely as, as a result, well, I think it's solely a result of being able to meet him at that random party at, uh, at Ken. And being on that list in Filmmaker Magazine also really helped things along too, mm -hmm. um, because the industry still, for the most part, does look to these sort of yeah. taste-making curated lists, yeah. Yeah. whatever. Um, and so that was, that was great. But again, no one is really coming to me with money to go make a movie. Uh, and the projects that I was interested in making, people weren't interested in 
funding those. Funding, right. Or supporting them. Did, did these things lead to work on any level? Yes, right, absolutely. So in in, ah, okay. in the other ways it did. So uh, through the Toronto Film Festival, I was able to meet the, um, uh, the producers of uh, Sesame Street who were looking for filmmakers to work with. Wow. And I, that sort of became like a long relationship. So I do a lot of work for Sesame Street. In the past, we got nominated for an Emmy Award for some of that work. What a cool thing that Sesame Street is out there looking for filmmakers. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. It's they, they're one of the people, like there's such a tremendous organization for a number of reasons. Uh -huh. um, one of them is because like, you know, all these organizations talk about diversity and how much it really cares and how much it really matters to them but they truly believe it and yeah. they will financially support it. And I came with them with like crazy ideas and they're like, sounds great. Here's some money going. <laughs> like we got to go film some, like they were doing a segment on pineapples and I was like, Oh, I, you know, I think there's some pineapple farmers in Trinidad. It would be great. And here's some money, go do it. And we were able to go to Trinidad and we filmed some like real pineapple farmers down in table land. It was amazing. Wow. And 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 are these films? Do they sort of appear in the middle of a show, like they'll have exactly. to yeah, yeah, yeah. Precisely. and then we'll go actually go and meet some pineapple farmers, and then we come back and uh, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's it's stuff like that. I mean, the segments, of that particular segment is about um, it's called Cookie Monsters, or it's called the Monster Foodie Truck, and the idea is that Cookie Monster now is a uh, has a food truck, okay. and he makes food with his with his friend, this other chef called Gonger. But more like what happens on the show, it's, it's, it's on this the segment is that, you know, kids call in, they want to make a food. Uh, this one kid calls in one day and wants, a, they want pineapple on their pizza. So pineapple is a special ingredient, but lo and behold, uh, Cookie Monster ate all of the pineapples. Oh. So they've got to go to the farm to get some more pineapples. But what's really cool about it is that it's really teaching children about where their food comes from yeah. and all of the steps involved in getting the food onto their plate, which is just special. Wonderful. Yeah. And you, then we did like a whole bunch of other projects for them as well. Um, the BBC in the fifties and sixties and seventies, and, and I'm not sure where they're at with that now, but how, how much the BBC did to give artists work. Yeah especially artists from the colonies. Absolutely. Were, right? Um, uh, C.R. Lewis, I'm thinking of, you know, those kind of from the 50s, 60s. Um, and the BBC was really a home for Caribbean artists and artists, you know, from around the world. Um, but I've never heard of the Sesame Street one, but it sounds like oh, it's yeah. a thing. They're great. They're constantly looking for new filmmakers. Mm -hmm. um, to work with they're great they're they're again they're a tremendous organization in terms of like their mission and their mandate but also the work that they uh that they support yeah that's fantastic so what other kinds of work i mean that's brilliant what other kinds of work came out of your short film wins yeah so i did a bunch of uh i made some other short films the other one that i made was called uh Karini, and that also screened at TIFF as well, and you know, screens still screens at festivals too. Um, I made is that a, a fiction story, or yeah, 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 and that was funded by an organization that's trying to. Um, it was it was funded by an organization called Imagine Science, mm -hmm. and they are committed to um, bridging the gap between art and science, uh -huh. and perfect for me, which is great. The yeah. organization and they funded that project which was terrific and it had a, a wonderful experience out in the world um mm -hmm. after that i made uh you know some smaller commercial stuff but then i did a feature documentary on um ian allen who some people might might know as a, a sort of controversial media figure in trinidad and is widely known throughout the caribbean um, for his take on on crime in Trinidad. Mm -hmm. And we filmed that for a number of months. And um, that personally, like I really love that film and I love the the topic. The reception of that film was a little bit disappointing because it was during the pandemic when we kind of had it out. And 
Um, I think if it wasn't the pandemic times, it probably would have had a better life out in the world. Right, right. Is it in distribution now? Um, yeah, more or less. I, I should just put it online, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> and I probably will eventually just, you know, put it up on Facebook because that's where, frankly, you know, we didn't make it for a lot of money, so it's not really about the money. Um, I think right now I just want people to see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what will people get from the film? Will they learn about Ian or will they learn about Trinidad? I think they learn about Ian because he's a, you know, as a, people either love him or hate him. Uh -huh. And for me as a storyteller, as a filmmaker, as a person that's really interested in characters, that's perfect. Um, and it's pretty, it's always meant to, to have been a character study of him yeah. rather than a exploration of crime in Trinidad of the Caribbean, which right. is a much larger story that's far more complicated than, uh, you know, that's like, that's like a two season Netflix se yeah. series <laughs> is, is that, um, to try to pull that apart. Yeah, that, that would be an amazing um, show to do. Uh, I remember years ago, I was going to Trinidad. Oh, I was taking a film crew to Trinidad. We made a film about Peter Mitchell that my film teacher then stole from me. So just um, clarifying that film is not out anywhere. Uh, so we were on the plane and we hear over the loudspeaker, Joanne Butcher, Joanne Butcher, come back to the gate. I was like, what? So I had to get off the plane and my friend who uh, worked for the airline and had helped us me find a place for everyone to stay. So I had my little address and we were going to get a taxi from Piaco and go there. Um, she said, you can't stay there. You can't stay there. There was a robbery last night on that street. And it was the first time that I'd heard anybody be scared mm -hmm. about crime in Trinidad. And this is like 20 years ago now. But Trinidad was a place that crime, what, you know, uh, and uh, I was like, why is she so scared? And we had to go to a different place. And and I just was sort of tuned into what is she so scared about? Mm. Right. But there was a shift and it was very sudden, I felt. Mm. In, uh, very sudden. And I think it was later than a lot of the islands. That's my my personal. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it came much later than the other islands. And it was shocking. Yeah. So yeah, Netflix series, yeah. <laughs> so you finally did get to make your fiction feature film, Doubles. It, does it have the whole title or is it just Doubles? It's just Doubles. Just Doubles, okay. Uh, so you finally did, so how did you do it? Because you said nobody was showing up with the check. And- yeah. uh, <laughs> it, was, it was actually incredibly, I mean, it took, took me 10 years to make it. Um, right. I tried a number of ways to make it. I tried to, you know, because the short was successful and, um, you know, for the most part, a lot of people know it, even just within the culture, a lot of people have seen it. Like it, it's done pretty good numbers on YouTube and Vimeo and what have you. PBS licensed it. So it screened across the States on TV. Um, so people knew it. Um, and so it was really important to me to try to make the film from the community. Um, so try to get the film funded by wealthy Trinidadians, um, whether in Trinidad or part of the diaspora in Toronto, New York, London, wherever. Uh, and Sounds like a reasonable plan, fundraising. Sounds like a reasonable plan. It was really hard, though. It was really, really hard. When it came time to people actually writing checks, it was difficult because there's no one that you can point to that made a successful film. Made a, I shouldn't say made a successful film. I should right. say has been able to profit of it or that's had like success financially. Yes, financial with success right. with a Trinidadian film. Yeah. Exactly. And that was that was really hard. That was really breaks like any other culture, you can point to somebody mm -hmm. um that's been able to do that. But there's there's no benchmark because it's so far because the culture uh particularly within Trinidad, particularly Indo-Caribbean culture is not one of the arts unless sorry unless it's music it's really you know right. really heavily around carnival and music and, and all of that and if you're not doing that um it's very hard for people to wrap their head around that right that right. side of the culture 
so I've I've heard, I mean, I just, you know, there are there's a small community, the Trinidadian film community, but there's Baza D, there's mm -hmm. Days by the River, yep. um, you know, various films that a hero mm -hmm. you know, that really got screened around the world. Um, but I don't think I've ever heard anybody say that they made money. Right, they exactly. Were actually successful. Exactly. And if you can, and that's what I've, like for the most part, people are like the people with money, um, you've got to appeal to them on a different level in terms of, because yeah. I know the reality is this movie is probably not going to make money. I know that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm okay with that personally, because I'm making this movie to make the next movie. Right. And, but at the same time, I'm asking people to put in their money into what yeah. I'm readily saying is not going to make any money. Right. And that's a hard thing for people to wrap their head around because you're, you're telling them, you're not going to make money off of this, but you're contributing to something that's really, really important, whether it's cultural capital, getting our stories up on the screen. Um, and that's all nice and good. But when it comes to actually writing a check, yeah. that becomes a lot, that becomes very difficult to, to, to wrap around people's head. Right, right. Did, did people come in more as donors or did they finally come in as investors? No, they came investors. neither. Uh, and yeah, I tried to do this as um, in Trinidad, and I've, you know, I was able to to meet with some really wealthy people, corporations in Trinidad, um, in New York, in Toronto. I, you know, you could name all of the wealthy people for the most part. I, I've hit them all up. Yes. And yeah, none, none of them did. Even like, I, I mean, I, I, I'm not going to name names or like corporations. Right. But like, yeah, everyone pretty much were said no. Um, and doesn't and doesn't Trinidad have some very interesting tax um, tax benefits uh, where investors can actually for sure? It? I'm no, I'm not going to say it out correctly. Yeah, so they they so they do. You're right. I I I don't know the exact numbers, but we wouldn't qualify for that because we wouldn't be called a local production. Um, uh -huh. And this is where, like, the sort of transnational yes. identity becomes a problem because we don't fit into these to any category in right. which we did of how people are making films these days. Yeah. And these institutions, I feel, need to change their ways. But, anyways, that's that's a whole other that's a whole other story. Um, so it was impossible to raise the money privately um, in any way, and frankly, because of you know because I am Canadian and I spend a lot of time in Canada um, and my, the work that I have has been, you know, successfully screened throughout Canada. Um, I was able to get the money through the Canadian funding system to make it eventually. Great. great. So telefilm, that kind yeah, of. Telefilm. Yeah. Without telefilm, this film doesn't get made. Okay. And, and the thing, the thing I think that's really interesting about the Canadian funding is that it's, um, it means that they're thinking, I'm being a little inarticulate today, but um, I would say that uh, when countries invest in films that, <laughs> excuse me, are going to be screened around the world at festivals, yep. not really, they're not really investing in those films in order to make their money back. True. They're, yeah, they're investing in those films in order to have a a um an imprint of the country around the world yeah they're, they're trying to build i mean i'm not going to speak for them but i think they're trying to build uh a canadian identity a canadian culture um but for the sake of for the sake of art and the sake of the culture of what it is the country really is um nowadays and i think they see the value of that um, and they see the value of the diversity. That's the thing right. I get from Canada. It's like they, it's a little bit like England, you know, it's like, we are multicultural, yay! You know, that's kind of how Canada comes across, you know, which is very right. different from America. Yeah, and, they, and, and again, like they do, they will support it financially. They say it and they actually do, they do that. Um, and so I got to like, I, I got to commend them for that. I mean, that's like, there's a lot of, 
you know, there's a lot of give and take with that comes with the money and that's totally fine. But ultimately, like they really believe in them in their mandate and what it is they're trying to do. Right, right. So I'm sure that there's a lot of red tape. There's a lot of hoops to go through. Yeah, for sure. All of that, you know, but it, it's public money. Other, the, what yeah. I always say to people when they're getting grants is as, as soon as you take public money, there has to be a, a level of accountability. For sure. That's going to be hard work. Oh, yeah. Like there are restrictions in terms of like, you know, how it really affected the production is for the most part, everyone has to be Canadian, both, you know, uh -huh. in front of the camera and behind the camera. Uh -huh. And that was very difficult because, um, you know, my producer, I had never worked with my producer ever before. Uh, my DP, I had never worked with that DP ever before. Um, and so that was hard. Right. But it was amazing because now I just have like a really strong network of other Canadian filmmakers that I can work with again. I'll we'll move on to the next. But how do you make a, a, a Trinidadian film with all Canadians? Uh, well, okay, so the most for our most of our lead actors are Canadian. Oh. Um, they're dual citizens or whatever they are. But yeah, they're all Canadian, except for um, the one of the leads is, is Trinidadian, Sanjeev Boudou. And that was really difficult to to make that happen because he's not Canadian, he's Trinidadian. Uh -huh. And they there was a big pushback from a lot of people, particularly the Canadian Actors Union, oh. um, to do that. Oh. And you know, we we made the argument that listen, we're looking for a really specific actor here in terms of they have to be Indo Trinidadian. Yeah. Somebody that can play that. And they're like, okay, well, is look the, through. The son? Is he the son? Or the, the son, father? yeah, yeah, exactly. Or the son. Oh, because it's so important because the father comes back from Canada. But it's okay. so specific that the son has never been. He's never left. Exactly. Trinidad. He's exactly. never been at. He's, he's poor from this tiny place. And it would be totally wrong if he, if he were Canadian. Exactly. And so they were like, okay, well, you got to look through our membership and find some actors. Wow. And we did find one or two Indo-Caribbean actors. One of them was uh, was unavailable. Um, and the other one, not to get too much into the details, but it was their agent proved it was going to be a little bit difficult to work with them. Yeah. Um, and so we went back to the union and we're like, listen, this is actually your problem. It's a problem with your membership that you have because you don't have the actors that we need. And this film is actually an opportunity for you to expand your membership and get a more diverse membership as a result. Right. Um, and they said, okay, what you need to do is do proof to us again that you're actually trying to find this actor from a Canadian, be Canadian. So we had to do like an open call uh -huh. um, and deal through that. And again, didn't lead to anything. Right. And it was only after that they allowed us a permit to to bring him up. Right. Wow. Interesting. Well, hoops. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was hoops. <laughs> hoops to get through. It was hoops to get um, through. So I like to open up uh, for questions if anybody has any questions in the last few minutes. Um, but my last question is, so um, what are you working on next? Or are you kind of deep in getting this film out and not thinking about the next film? Where where are you at in your artistic process? Yeah, uh, definitely just wor working on distribution of this film um, for sure. We already have Canadian distribution, so I'm not too worried about that. Uh, we're working on something within the Caribbean and in Trinidad. We're working on that right now. Um, but we're really looking for US distribution and um, and Europe and, and around the world off of that after that. Uh, I'm also working on an adaptation. Actually, I've got it right here on my bookshelf. Oh, it's an adaptation of um, of this book. It's called uh, I'm not sure if you can see that. It's by David. Another another title that no non Trinidadian would understand. Yeah, but this this <laughs> absolutely exactly. Uh, but the book is it's it's it was written by this author named David Cheriandi, and there was a big film in Canada last year. Um, called Brother, and it screened. I think it premiered, it premiered at TIFF, and I think it went to the uh, London Film Festival. Played around a little bit, um, and it was really successful in Canada. Um, and this is so that's the writer of that, and 
of that project. And I'm working on his first book, basically adapting his first book. Right. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Um, and so he's already had experience of making a film. Yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Does, does, Mark, do you have a question? Uh, yeah. First of all, I'm really, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, 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 I'm really glad that I saw that there was a time change on our uh, <laughs> meeting today. And uh, uh, Ian, it was really a fascinating interview, seeing what you're doing. I, I really admire that that you're making films where you say from the get-go, this isn't about making money. Uh, it's it's about the, the content. And I, I mean, I understand that you've made short films and that you've made some feature films. What's your, what's your focus moving forward? What kind of films do you wanna be working on moving forward? Yeah, you know, it's a good question. Um, I'm interested in stories that that move me, um, that I that I'm able to connect with in one way or another. Uh, like this this particular one that I'm like I'm this isn't a story that I wrote, right? It's an adaptation of a book. It's someone else's story that I'm adapting, but there's something in there that speaks to me, um, and that's what I'm interested in. Like I'm hoping I'm able to tell those those stories. Not necessarily that I've written that have come from me, but that I can see myself, or it speaks to some part of my experience in one way or another. Are there any specific themes that you're that you're uh, pursuing, or is it just sort of everything is its own universe? I'm interested in like I'm interested in stories about family um, and the stresses that are put on family. Uh, mm -hmm whether that's like, you know, father-son stories or, you know, mother-daughter or even husband-wife. I'm interested in like really fundamental human relationships. Um, and those are the stories that interest me always. Even uh, in, in the movies that I watch, I'm really fascinated by, um, by those. But even frankly, like you can get those same relationships in a Marvel movie, right? Um, uh -huh. Like those human relationships exist in, in any genre. That's what I'm interested in. Mm. The stress, particularly of of immigration. Are yeah, there immigration, any, absolutely. Are yeah. there any particular causes that you're that that you're pursuing, or is it really just the, the, about family relations? Causes, I you know, I'm not really. You know, some people, some in like Q and A's, people always ask me or often ask what do I want the audience to learn or like what's the uh, what's the takeaway from the movie? And I've never really, you know, frankly, I've never really thought about a film as uh, as like a medium for a lesson. For me, I'm more interested in moving people. And if people have an emotional response after the film or during the film, I feel like that's enough for me. Um, I'm interested in moving people emotionally. And if I do that, I feel that I'm successful with that. Is Great. there any, is there anywhere people can see doubles with slight pepper? Or... Yeah, that's on Vimeo. That's on YouTube. That's just a Google. Okay, uh, it'll, Emily, it'll can you put the link um, in the chat because I would love for Mark and Lloyd to be able to see the film because one of the things I think um, with the film and I think this is a little bit what you're asking, Mark. One of the things that I saw is that I had these I had these kind of Trinidadian responses. I was like, oh my God, it's Trinidad. Oh my God, it's doubles. Oh my God, it's, you know, uh, but but as the story went along, it was so moving. And and it's just incredible to see a filmmaker be able to do that. Mm. You know, um, it's a short, you know, it's not a long film or anything, but it was so moving, so heartbreaking. Um, the relationships and the, the the brokenness of the relationships and the um you know the attempts to heal the you know um and perhaps the best that we can do is you know share some food or something you know it was it was very, it was incredibly moving and and that was you know I hear so many people say things like um oh you know films today they you know, all they care about is big budget films and you know Marvel, and it's like no, it's totally not true. You know, it stands out, and the kind of awards that you got with and everything with the film. This is an incredibly moving film. That's what won the awards. 
yes, the local, the specificity, I think is also, you know, very, very important. But the fact is, it's just a deeply, profoundly moving film. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Um, and uh, for for the next movie, for Sukhyan, do you think that you will um, have the same kind of problems with the funding and a need to go to kind of institutional funding as you have in the past? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, the, this film is being set up in Canada with like a decent, um, you know, a far more experienced production company and producers. Uh, it'll be a far more bigger budget um, as well. But yeah, I, th I think we're going to have to be stay within that sort of Canadian system. Um, because frankly, I, I haven't seen a way to be able to make films any other, or at least make the films that I want to make um, any any other way. No one's Again, like I, I, I wish the film could have been made um, independently, with you know money from within the community, but that just it just it wasn't going to happen. Right, right. I mean, I think that the that Ava DuVernay's um, articles and interviews that she's doing right now, talking about the way that she funded Origin, is really um, really fascinating um, because. You know, she's made hundred million dollar movies for Disney before, you know. But here she is going around and and raising institutional funding to make a movie that she wants to make that investors are not going to in invest in. I think it's really interesting to be hearing that story from her. Or, or have you seen Origin? Not yet. No. I, I, I saw I, it, I, and I, it's... I'm buying my ticket, but it's not out till January or something. It's remarkable. It's the best film of the year for sure. It's remarkable. Um, it's, it's an amazing movie uh, you're the I'm second person I've spoken to who's seen it so I'm really really annoyed now <laughs> <laughs> you should be it's really good it's really really good uh -huh. I just saw the color purple this weekend uh -huh. and I was and I made this little video afterwards because I said I, I cried buckets I don't think I've ever cried so hard at a movie. But when I was going to the movie, I was like, why am I going to see The Color Purple? I've seen it. I saw it years ago. What's the point? It's different. It's definitely There's different. It's definitely a point. <laughs> but yeah, I can't wait to see Origin. That's definitely the next on my list. Well, Ian, thank you so much for um, bending time uh, to, to fit us in. And uh, I'm so glad that I finally met you. Emily was very, very, very insistent. <laughs> and I tried, as I said, I tried to meet you in Trinidad, but I I, I didn't get to the screening. I think it was this year, right? Yeah. Well, yep. Yeah. But I missed it. I got in the, the next day. Um, so fabulous to finally meet you. And uh, we'll, we'll have to, to keep talking. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Take care. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye. Bye, folks. Thank you. Go Buffalo, Lloyd. I see you, Lloyd. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, folks.